Welcome back, everybody. Well, yesterday's reaction video to Germany could not win World War II by potential history was so popular that uh, I'm glad that we have a follow-up that we can do right away. Several of you pointed out there is a part two that they've since added. I didn't know it at the time because the first one that we did yesterday wasn't labeled as part one, so I thought it was a standalone thing. But I'm ready to dive right back into part two, and I have a feeling it's going to answer some of the things that I addressed uh, as possible scenarios in which Germany could win World War II yesterday. Uh, thank you very much for pushing this channel over 50,000 subscribers. We did that within a couple of hours of the video going live yesterday. Uh, we do have our three winners of the biographies, and I've reached out to them. Once I've heard from all three of them, I will announce that on the channel. But I can tell you that we have one in the United States, one in Sweden, and one in Serbia. So it's exciting to see kind of that cross-section uh, of people from across the world that uh, entered that competition and uh, were winners uh, in the giveaway. We're going to do another one real soon. Uh, so be watching for that. Make sure you have your notifications turned on after you've subscribed so that you don't miss any posts about uh, the giveaways that we're going to be doing. But let's go ahead and dive into part two. If you didn't see part one, the link's in the description. You can go back and watch that first and then follow up with this one. It's like Medal of Honor. Excellent work with the German Miss Pal. Here's to hoping better sources will be used in the future. However, our intel has picked up reports of continued resistance in the Comet sections. Mentions of Dunkirk and who not to invade seem widespread. We will be dropping you directly into the Comet section with your primary objective being to root out these myths. Be cautious though. Reports indicate that the Wereboos will be armed with Cold War era memoirs and David Irving books. So just before we even get started, something about comments. You know, when you create a YouTube channel like I have, I have two of them. And um, when you create a channel, you understand that what goes with that is that you're going to get a small percentage of people that are just nasty in the comments. Uh, along with the people that are saying stuff that has nothing to do with anything and the occasional person showing up saying that they're Adolf Hitler and that kind of stuff. But, um, and we deal with this with my daughter. She, she's 15. She's got 175,000 subscribers. And there's a really tiny percentage of those people that are just mean and just really offer nothing to the conversation. And, and so you accept that. And I'm sure he gets that as well. I'll say this about comments. Uh, first of all, as I've mentioned often, I read every single comment on every video even if I don't respond to it. And I encourage people to disagree with me because I recognize that I don't know it all and that I have bias and I have opinions and sometimes those are going to be wrong and I need to be challenged in those. So I invite that and I hope you understand that I invite that. But we can do those things in a civil way, in a way that preserves a person's dignity and uh, can do so in kindness. You can debate vigorously and you can have strong disagreements, as I sometimes do with people in the comment section on videos or uh, over on Discord. But you can do so in a way that says, hey, I still respect you. I disagree with you but I can do that in a way that still treats you with kindness. So uh, I very rarely delete comments, but if somebody's just being mean or being a jerk, I'll delete it because I don't have any time for that. And there's 99.9% .9 of you guys are awesome and we have great discussions and we learn from each other. So that's what it's all about. Godspeed, Lieutenant. This video is brought to you by Dashlane. Stay secure online and never forget a password again. More on that later. So you may recall around six months ago, I made a video about how due to Germany's lacking in the population, industrial, and raw material sectors, they could not have pulled out a victory in the war they started in 1939. And it sort of got out of hand. I think we should read the comments. <laughs> yep. The other day, as I was reading the comment section there, I found that, along with some people agreeing with me, there were a lot of dissenting opinions of yet more ways that people thought the final victory could be achieved. And I am here today to respond to them, and also probably clear up what I meant at the end of the last video talking about limited use of alternative history. Here are a few more ways Germany could not have won World War II. 
One thing I have seen brought up a few times is that if Hitler had not let the British Expeditionary Force get away at Dunkirk, that later the troops could not be used during Operation Overlord and thus no Western Front, with the implication that the German troops could have been sent east to stop the Soviets. This, however, has two problems. Firstly, the BEF was not simply allowed to leave France, as this narrative suggests. In Mein Kampf, Hitler does speak highly of the British at times and suggests that they could be a potential ally, but this is clearly without a strong grasp of British culture and political policy and was always discussed with Germany being above Britain and having them be administrators of the Reich. But so, first of all, I would say this. I don't think that saying that Hitler let the British get away means that he did it on purpose. I think maybe that's a misinterpretation of what people are saying. What it means is, is that he made a mistake by not destroying and, and or capturing them before they got away, by putting a halt to the uh, forces so that they could reorganize and do and resupply and everything before they crushed the British. I don't think that means that he let it happen on purpose. I think there's a discrepancy there. So the real question then becomes, had the three or four hundred thousand British soldiers that were trapped at Gun uh, Dunkirk been captured or killed, would that have changed the outcome of the war? And I don't think it would have. But only if they could shake their, quote, Jewish influence. Furthermore, he realized that Britain was against his intentions in the east and would become a barrier there. All this being said, by the time of the invasion of France, Britain was definitely an enemy and Hitler was doing them no favors. So then why Dunkirk? Well, this was an operational failing, not a peaceful gesture. Yeah, and I... I've never heard anybody say otherwise. I've never heard anybody say that it was on purpose to let the British go. So I'm really not sure where he's getting that from, unless there are people in the comments that actually think that. On May 15th, 1940, the Germans broke through the French 2nd and 9th armies and steamed ahead night and day, thanks in part to some tablet boys, towards the coast. Although these gains were good for the Germans, the mechanized forces were quickly running out of supplies and were leaving their flanks exposed, which opened them to being cut off, the result of which could cause ruin for the German plans. It is at this point a nervous Hitler, being counseled by Generals von Kluge and von Rundstedt, gave a halt order to secure the flanks and allow the exhausted panzer divisions to refit. Check out this video by Mark Gerges for more. Upon the halt, our favorite drug-addled flyboy, Goering, promised the Luftwaffe could destroy the British at Dunkirk, and although he failed, I would hardly call the actions of the Luftwaffe just letting the British go. With thousands being killed, over 200 ships being sunk, over 100 planes shot down, and the loss of all the BEF's equipment, Hitler even realized that the halt was an error and resumed the attack while the evacuation was underway so and highly recommend you check out the movie dunkirk it's made by christopher nolan who did inception and so there's a little bit of mind bending going on as far as the timelines go and it gets a little weird with that but highly recommend the movie itself watched it again last night actually um but yeah uh, i think this is this whole thing's built around a, a misunderstanding of what the word hitler let them get away means. And I'll give you an example of how that works. Uh, I did a video recently on U.S. presidents, and I mentioned something in the video about John F. Kennedy dying in office. And somebody thought that I meant that John F. Kennedy wasn't assassinated and that he actually died in his office. And that's just really a misunderstanding of what dying in office means, which just means that he died while he was still president. Same thing here. Saying Hitler let them go doesn't mean he said, okay, let them go. It means he made a mistake and they got away. And it was only successful due to the brave French soldiers that held out until it was complete. But even if he had let them go, there are still more problems asserting that this means a German victory in the war. Britain had to rearm all the soldiers evacuated, which is a huge loss and took some time. This force when returned to England was not in any way ready to turn around and invade France. Although the troop reserves were good to have if Germany decided to invade. But here's the thing, even if there were not sufficient ground forces uh, to defeat the German army on land, they still had, uh, Germany didn't have naval supremacy, they didn't have air supremacy to the degree that they would have needed to be able to drop paratroopers and land troops uh, on land and sufficiently uh, carry out Operation Sea Lion, which was their plan to invade Britain. But they were not in fighting condition for a long time. 
But most importantly, Britain is not the only nation present at D-Day. A combined landing force of American, British, and Canadian forces, along with smaller groups from other countries, landed and fought on the Western Front. Although the troop loss, if Dunkirk had failed, may have limited Britain's number of troops, the United States, having only mobilized about 9% of its population in the course of the war, could have very realistically filled in the gaps as it did in reality with the British equipment losses. But all of this still doesn't take into account where the real war is being fought, in the East. The German army will be decidedly on its back foot after Kursk, and the Soviets have massive offensives planned in 1944 regardless of what the Western Allies do. Would the defeat of Germany have taken longer without the Western Front opening? Of course it would. But by 1944, the Soviets have a decisive upper hand and will push the Germans back to Berlin. So to say the war could have been shifted if the British had 300,000 fewer troops ignores the reality of what the Germans were truly up against by 1944. And, for that matter, whether the... British had those 300,000 troops back across the channel as they did back into Britain or captured or killed doesn't change the fact that it freed up those troops. So once the British were evacuated out of Dunkirk, those troops were still freed up to be able to head to the east. Uh, anything short of actually knocking Britain out of the war by conquering them wasn't going to change the outcome uh, with the West. So, uh, you know, it, Dunkirk is a non-factor as far as I'm concerned. I think that had zero impact on the outcome of the war. That we this talked about yesterday. A lot. Just don't invade the Soviet Union, or just don't declare war on the United States. And although these comments are puzzling on the surface, as removing a major combatant redefines what the war is, and you are now describing how to win a smaller conflict, there are reasons this doesn't work that are all to do with character motivation and why these things were going to happen unless you fundamentally change who the Germans and Hitler were yep. and strain to fiction. Let's first start with the Soviet Union. If you read Mein Kampf, don't do it, it's not a very good book, or listen to a lot of Hitler's speeches, both in public and in private, he fixates on this idea of Judeo-Bolshevism, which is a rather outdated term that grew out of the idea of a Jewish conspiracy that had created communism, and the two were the biggest evils facing the Aryan nation. There's a whole rabbit hole to go down here with multiple theorists and their ideas, but I'm not going to go into it here. But that's the basic idea, and Hitler subscribed to it. And the result of this is Hitler's main goal being to destroy the Soviet Union and become the savior of the Aryan people in his eyes. And in the process, wiping out millions of subhuman Slavs and resettle the land with Germans. Hitler saw this as his destiny, meaning he was going to do it at some point, and that this fictitious Hitler that would win World War II by not invading the East is just that. 100% agree with that. That is a incredibly valid point. You know, you've heard me talk about my own views on the fact that Hitler didn't need to invade the Soviet Union, that I don't subscribe to the theory that he had to have Soviet oil to win um, b because he never got it. And, you know, that whole thing, we talked about that yesterday, but that requires us to change who Hitler is. And that's not a factor. So um, while we could argue that not invading the Soviet Union could have changed the outcome of the war, that requires Hitler to not be Hitler. And that was never going to happen. So then the question, the only real question is the timing. And when was the best time to do it? Fiction. He ceases becoming the Hitler that we know and that existed. And now we're talking about a made up story. Now as to why the Soviet Union was invaded when it was comes down to two things. Resources and frankly paranoia. Germany, as I outlined in my previous video on this, spent a lot of the war with fairly limited oil resources and knew that it couldn't support this attack any later than June of 41 with all the fuel that the battle over Britain was consuming. And even the trade with the Soviet Union would not make up for this deficit. So the high command felt they had to go in when they did before the army would not be able to move as they needed to finish the campaign by September. Now that I will agree with. If they were going to attack the Soviet Union, which because of the ideology that Hitler and others had, was going to happen. If they were going to do it, they had to do it when they did and no later. They maybe could have done it sooner. I don't know. Uh, but probably not much sooner because of the, the fight against France and Britain. Uh, so it, from that standpoint, I agree that they couldn't have done it any later because their resources were only going to keep going downhill. Um, so if the idea in Hitler's mind was we can defeat Soviets quickly enough to grab their oil to make up for any shortfalls that we cause because of our massive invasion. That I get, and that I agree with. 
the time in which the High Command figured the Soviet Union would collapse in on itself under the weight of the German attack. And I'll point you to David Stahill again for more information on that. The other aspect was, as I said, paranoia. I've often seen this assertion stated in a different way of don't break the alliance with the Soviet Union, although I wouldn't even frame the German-Soviet non-aggression pact as an alliance in the way you think of with the Axis and allies. The and that's true. There, there are lots of different forms that these kinds of agreements take. Alliance is kind of a broad term that can mean different things. There are mutual defense pacts where you make an agreement with another nation that if anybody attacks them, you'll defend them. If anybody attacks you, they'll defend you. That's not what this was. This is a non-aggression pact, which means we promise not to fight you even if you do some shady things and you promise not to fight us for the same reason, especially if we go after the same territory. Uh, and sometimes defense pacts have limitations too. For example, Britain has this defense pact with, and France as well, with Poland that says that if they are the victims of German aggression, that they will come to their aid. They will declare war on Germany. Said nothing about if somebody else attacks Poland. It wasn't just a blanket defense treaty that said, if anybody attacks you, we will attack them. It was specific to Germany so that when the Soviet Union attacked Poland from the east, uh, Britain and France had nothing to say about that because that wasn't covered by the treaty. The treaty was much more in the vein of, you don't get in our way, we won't get in your way, let's trade some stuff. And it was very uneasy at many points before and during its existence, becoming most volatile during combat between German and Soviet soldiers during the Poland campaign, after the Germans overran the territory that was designated as theirs and moved into territory promised to the Soviets that actually contained oil fields, making it not very subtle what the Germans were trying to do. Both Stalin and Hitler knew that some form of war was coming, just not when and who would start it, but going out of their way for the most part to not provoke it and they didn't trust each other whatsoever. Mm. Now, I'm not implying any kind of Savorov preventative war type thing. The Soviet Union was refitting and probably wouldn't be ready for a large war until at least mid-1942, but with these two ideologically opposing powers taking territory so quickly right next to each other, it was something that was bound to happen as soon as one of them felt they were in a position to make the first move. Yeah. By 1941, the Germans felt they were, and they took the opportunity. And that's fair, too. I mean, there's nothing that, that says that Stalin wouldn't have violated the... Uh, Molenkopf, uh, uh, Ribbentrop Pact himself. Uh, just because Germany did it when they did does not mean that Stalin wouldn't have done the same thing a few months or a year later. For more on this and the German-Soviet clashings in Poland, I'll point you towards Stephen Kotkin's second book in his Stalin series or this video of him talking about it. The declaration of war on the U.S. is a bit more tricky, especially given that Hitler was aware of the industrial capacity of the nation. However, he saw the U.S. as very internally focused and figured that it would take them much longer to mobilize than it did. Hitler always planned for war with the United States, as outlined in his second book, written but not published, in 1928, but wanted to put it off until he was ready, often skipping on details about how it would be done. He began to assume that, due to some anti-German sentiments from Roosevelt, the Americans would declare war in 1942 coming to the aid of the Allies like they did in World War I. Piggybacking off the previous statements about the Soviets, he figured he could end the war in the East and turn and fight the West. This feeling ended, though, as the Soviet campaign continued to drag on and 1942 loomed. The German Navy had been asking for war with the United States for some time. As so, yeah, let's talk about this for a second. Hitler declares war on the United States before the United States declares war on, on uh, Germany uh, in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. And... For a long time, that's baffled a lot of people because there was really no great benefit, at least on the surface, to Germany doing that. Um, because then what ends up happening is you actually have the United States making Germany the first priority in the war. It was a Germany first policy. Finish off Germany, then we'll worry about finishing off Japan. And that's kind of how it happened. Which So it's really strange because Hitler didn't directly attack the United States. But you have to remember, the U.S., while neutral, was providing massive amounts of supply to Britain and to the Soviet Union. And the German Navy wanted to have unrestricted access to be able to sink as many American supply ships as possible. And they felt somewhat restricted by the fact that they weren't directly at war with them. A similar situation to World War I, where you have unrestricted submarine warfare on any shipping uh, that uh, approaches Britain. And so you warn them about that. And so the same thing's happening here. They want to be able to sink these supplies before they get to the Allies that are at war. 
Having said that, though, yeah, that one baffles me a lot. Why? Why Hitler did that? Uh, I think the U.S. eventually enters the war anyway in in Europe, but probably not quite as quickly. As Hitler had been holding them back to not provoke them, knowing that going against the U.S. Navy, the Kriegsmarine would come up lacking. Hitler's solution to this was Japan, which had a large navy that he thought could tie up the Americans until he was done in Russia, then turn westward and save his plan. He constantly reassured the Japanese that Germany would throw in with them if they expanded their territory south into U.S.-held islands. This was among many attempts to get Germany and Japan to fight the same enemy, which also included trying to get Japan to invade the Soviet Union from the east in June. Although Japan kept Hitler in the dark as to when they were going to attack, Hitler was very pleased when they did and immediately lifted all restrictions on his navy to attack U.S. ships and later declared war a few days later after his foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, said, A great power does not allow itself to be declared war upon. Hmm. It declares war on others. <laughs> so, and it, knock, knock, it's kind of funny. It's like, I am the one who knocks. You know, if you've ever seen um, Breaking Bad, he's saying, you know, I'm not the one that's going to have that done to me. I'm going to do it to them first. And that's kind of that attitude. I will say this, you know, I, I disagreed with him on some things in the first episode, agree with him a lot more on these ones, but I will say this, whether I agree with him hundred percent on everything or not, there's no question that, uh, his channel, uh, potential history, he does his homework. This is not somebody who's just speaking about opinions. He's backing up what he says with information. And while you can disagree with his conclusions, you can't disagree with the fact that he's definitely done the background work and he even links to a lot of his sources and a lot of the people who make these arguments. I give him a lot of credit for that because not everybody on YouTube does that. Now, this decision may have been flawed with the hindsight of putting too much faith in the Japanese Navy and underestimating the U.S.'s ability to fight on two fronts and mobilize so quickly, but knowing that Hitler did plan to fight the U.S. way back in the 20s, the timing may be bad given what we know now, but it was not something that he was just not going to do, in the same way he was not going to just opt out of invading the Soviet Union. I wouldn't put those two things on the same level. The Soviet Union, there's an ideological issue there. Uh, where Hitler was always going to try and take them out. And they're also a bordering country that has a lot of space, Lebensraum, which he's talked about in this video. I think the plan of fighting the United States was more of an anticipation of inevitability than it was an active desire on Hitler's part to fight the United States. I think Hitler would have been perfectly satisfied with not fighting the United States if he thought he could avoid it. So I don't think it was something he was actively seeking. This, this was never going to happen. I see the most. Take the British out before you turn east. As if it was that simple. The Germans tried this. First by attempting to bomb the British into submission, which didn't work. And second, by planning the invasion of the British home island in an operation named Sea Lion. This was going to be the amphibious assault that would take Britain out of the war, and plans were drawn up and early preparations were made. But before going through with it, the Germans themselves realized this wasn't going to work and canceled it. The short answer for why is the Royal Navy and the inability of the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe to control the channel. The German Navy would be unable to keep the channel clear of British warships to enable troops and supplies to reach the British coast unless the army's landing was on a very narrow front. So you have to think about this for a, sec a second. Think about the logistics... Uh, and the complicated nature of the Allied invasion of Normandy. This is multiple nations, multiple nations who had complete naval and air supremacy in the region, and yet there were still significant challenges, and it was still very questionable whether or not it was going to be successful. So now you take all of that same information, you back it up by uh, three or four years, in terms of the timeline and the technology, you take away that complete air and naval supremacy, and then you ask yourself, is this still possible? I don't think it was possible with complete air and naval supremacy to do that so easily. Uh, so no, I, I, I think it's really kind of severe fantasy to think that there was any chance of Operation Sea Lion being taken, uh, undertaken effectively and successfully in 1940-41. Resulting in less water needing to be covered. Knowing the coast was going to be heavily defended, the army rejected this plan as they would need a wide landing front so they were not just feeding men into a meat grinder. In short, the Germans did not have the material to carry out a successful landing without it either bogging down and being cut off on the ground or being simply sunk on the way to its destination. 
In the 70s, the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst wargamed the scenario with conditions favorable to the Germans and came up with the operation being a total failure. Some commenters have gone as far as to suggest using paratroopers to take the British down, but I think you need to only look as far as Crete and Arnhem to see how badly an unsupported airborne operation can go. The Ger now, I will back off my comments just a, a, a hair when I said that if you compare this to Normandy, you also have to remember, though, that the British didn't have the level of defense uh, on the coastline. They didn't have the Atlantic Wall that Hitler had. So um, that all being said, I still don't think it was possible. Germans would still have to land by sea to resupply them and get relief troops on the ground. And the Royal Navy was too large an obstacle to allow this to happen, even by the Germans' own admission. One particular comment out of all of them really stood out to me. It began with, if the Nazis weren't Nazis, they would have won. Yep. And I think this really speaks to the core of my point. Alternative history is fun. It makes for good Hoi 4 games. But when really talking about it seriously, it's really hard to come by any academic conclusions outside of a few days of speculation. Because you begin building assumption on assumption on assumption, and before you know it, you have changed the motivations and decision-making patterns of everybody you're talking yep. about. And you are then just writing fan fiction. This is your brain. This is your brain on alternative history. Would Germany have won World War II if the Nazis weren't in power? Maybe. But it's also equally likely they wouldn't have started the war, or yeah. joined the Allies, or anything else. If there's no basis in reality to do with the people you are talking about in your assumption, what's the point? Germany decided to start a war that within a little over two years would see them taking on three superpowers at once, with the resources of most of the world behind them. Add in strategic mistakes and intelligence failures, it paints a very grim picture from the start, regardless of decisions made after the fact. So I would say in closing, I would agree with uh, what he said there at the end. Uh, the bottom line, it's absolutely correct that uh, in order to create a scenario in which Germany wins the war, it requires the Nazis to not be Nazis. I think that's a fair statement. It requires Hitler to not be Hitler. Uh, it requires him to change his motivations, his thinking, the way of doing things, the way that the leadership operated, all of that stuff. Absolutely 100% agree with that. So from that standpoint, I would agree with the statement that Germany couldn't win the war. Are there ways Germany could have won the war? Sure, but not with the people in charge that they had. So that's a fair statement, and that's one I wouldn't disagree with. But let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Let me know that. And uh, I'm always looking for suggestions for ideas for reaction videos. I think we are going to dive back into another extra history video series starting tomorrow. But we'll be doing some other things alongside that. So it'll be more than just that every day. There'll be probably some days with two videos coming. So be watching for those. As always, thank you so much. We'll see you again soon.